two, one. The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point. Pursuant to Committee Rule 4, the chair may postpone further proceedings on approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment. Without objection, all members will have five days to submit statements or extraneous materials on today's business. To insert statements into the record, please have your staff email the previously circulated address or, con or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to members joining remotely, please keep your video function on at all times, even when not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Consistent with House rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum. We are first going to do a quick unanimous consent agreement between me and the ranking member, and I now recognize the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a unanimous consent request. The ranking member is recognized for unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For purposes of Section 4820H2B of Title 50 of the United States Code, and premised upon the national interest determination described therein, I ask unanimous consent that the committee authorize the disclosure of some non-business confidential aggregate data derived from documents provided to the committee by the Department of Commerce on May 18, 2021, regarding export licensing decisions concerning entities on the entity list. Such authorization does not include the disclosure of the applicant's names, trademark, or brand names, item descriptions, or ECCN, or license numbers, and the Department of Commerce will provide additional context on the export control licensing process, which will be included with the aggregate data being authorized for disclosure. So ordered. And the chairman and the ranking member have reached an agreement that the aggregate data contained in these two documents are to be released consistent with 50 U.S.C. 4820H2B2. And I'm placing these documents into the record. I want to thank the ranking member for his re UC request and for working together to get a mutually agreed upon arrangement. Now let's move on to the markup. As members were notified yesterday, we intend to first consider four measures and their amendments in block. We will then move to consider one measure and its amendments separately. Any vo roll call votes will be postponed until the end of the markup. Pursuant to notice, for purposes of markup, I now call up the measures and their amendments that were previously circulated to members' offices without objection will be considered in block that each measure is considered as read and the amendments to each are considered as read and are agreed to. And without objection, after remarks, the committee will vote to order the measures favorably reported in block as amended if amended, and any amendment or amendments to each bill shall be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. The measures in the in block package are H.R. 5497, the Burma Act of 2021, with a Perry Amendment number 138. H.R.E.S. 569, expressing continued solidarity with the Lebanese people after the devastating explosions at the Port of Beirut on August 4th, 2020, and the continued efforts to form a secure, independent, and democratic Lebanon. H.R.E.S. 445, condemning all violence and human rights abuses in Ethiopia and calling on the government of Ethiopia and the government of the state of Eritrea to remove all Eritrean troops from Ethiopia and for all belligerents in the conflict, including the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the Tigray's People Liberation Front, the Amhara Regional Forces, and other armed groups to cease all hostilities, protect human rights, allow unfettered humanitarian access and cooperate with independent investigations of credible atrocity allegations. H.R.E.S. 720, 
calling for stability, the cessation of violence, condemning ISIS-affiliated terrorist activity in northern Mozambique, including the Cabo Delgado province, and for other purposes. And H.R. 5497, the Burma Act of 2021, with the Perry Amendment number 369. I now recognize myself to speak on the in block package. I support all of these bipartisan measures. As chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I take seriously this committee's responsibility to identify and respond to human rights abuses taking place around the world. From day one, this committee has worked tirelessly to do just that, whether it be on behalf of the Uyghurs who face genocide in China, the women, youth, and minority groups of Afghanistan whose futures are at risk under the Taliban, the people facing crises on multiple fronts throughout Ethiopia or in Cambodia, in Haiti, in Iran, El Salvador, in Russia, in Belarus, you name it. Time and again, this committee has and will continue to work rigorously to respond to human rights abuses in a swift, forceful, and responsible manner. The measures being considered today continue this committee's important responsibility for helping those in need of our country's help and support. I was proud to introduce H.R. 5497, the Burma Act of 2021, along with Ranking Member McCall and Representatives Berra and Shabbat, Chair and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Non-Proliferation, respectively. And my thanks to Mr. Shabbat and Mr. McCall in particular for working with me to keep this legislation bipartisan. Democracy is under threat around the world, and Congress cannot and must not stand idly by when a thuggish military blatantly disregards the will of citizens as happened in Burma in February. This legislation imposes targeted sanctions in response to the illegal and illegitimate coup and the ensuing human rights abuses which has cost the lives of over a thousand people and displaced thousands more. We need to support, support the Burmese people and their struggle for human rights and a path toward democracy. My bill authorized state and USAID to provide greater civil society and humanitarian support in Burma and surrounding countries. It calls on the State Department to finally make a determination as to whether the repression of the Rohingya constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide, positions the United States to step up diplomatic pressure on Burma and calls for the United Nations to take more decisive action against the military to send a powerful message. This, this bill has been endorsed by over 240 Burmese diaspora and civil society organizations as well as the U national unity government. There's overwhelming support for this bill from those fighting for freedom in Burma. Let's show them that we stand in solidarity with the people of Burma. H.R.E.S. 445 by Representative Bass, Chair of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health and Global Human Rights, condemns all violence and human rights abuses throughout Ethiopia and calls on all combatants to cease hostilities protect human rights, allow unfettered humanitarian access, and cooperate with independent investigations of atrocities carried out by all sides. The crisis in northern Ethiopia threatens the fabric and stability of the country and the greater Horn of Africa. And this resolution comes at a time when the government of Ethiopia has launched a fresh offensive and air attack airstrikes into Gray in recent days. The United States and the international community continue to implore all parties to the conflict to consider the economic, political, and humanitarian consequences of a conflict that is spiraling out of control. This committee remains deeply troubled by ongoing reports of rampant human, abuse, human rights abuses, excessive and targeted ethnic violence, and humanitarian blockages that have caused the death and displacement of so many innocent people. This important resolution lays out specific steps all stakeholders should take, including the government of Ethiopia, the United States, 
and other members of the international community to encourage an end to the conflict, establish a meaningful and inclusive national dialogue, and provide humanitarian support to the most vulnerable populations throughout the country. This resolution serves as another measure that demonstrates the United States' commitment to bringing an end to this violent and devastating conflict. The humanitarian crisis in northern Ethiopia remains the subject of great attention by this committee, and I'm grateful to my colleague for her work on this resolution. A resolution by Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs condemns the violence targeting of civilians and terrorist attacks carried out by ISIS Mozambique in the northern Mozambican province of Cabo Delgado. I am deeply concerned about the ongoing humanitarian crisis created by relentless and brutal attacks on innocent people, including young children in Cabo Delgado province. While I'm encouraged by the work regional partners such as Rwanda and South Africa have done to help quell some of the violent attacks and retake territory from ISIS, the government of the Republic of Mozambique must continue to work with the international community to address the widespread, widespread <coughs> displacement, food insecurity, and economic devastation brought about by the years-long violence in the North. The United States has demonstrated its commitment to support the Moz Mozambican government in this regard, as well as through security sector assistance provided by the Department of State and the De Department of Defense. This resolution calls on Moz Mozambican government to work with us and the broader international community to help bring an end to the conflict provide humanitarian support to the vulnerable and displaced populations in Cabo Delgado, and promote human rights and the rule of law as they work to address instability in the North. The committee will continue to watch these developments closely, and I am heartened to see my colleagues' hard work and dedication to moving this resolution forward. And finally, HRES 569 expresses solidarity with the Lebanese people following the devastating explosions at the port of Beirut on August 4, 2020, and causing the Lebanese government to investigate the blast, root out corruption, and work closely with international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank to stabilize the economy. Lebanon continues to struggle with prolonged fiscal challenges and humanitarian needs, and I, along with a number of members, have called for continued U.S. engagement and support to address these crises. And finally, as tensions on the investigation into the blast rise, it is imperative that we make clear we support the right of the Lebanese people to engage in peaceful demonstration and assembly in order to achieve accountability, democratic political representation, increased civil rights, anti-corruption reforms. I strongly support all the measures that we are considering today in the end block, and I urge all members to do the same. I now recognize our ranking member, Mr. Call of Texas, for his remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this markup. I also want to thank you for including my Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act. I really appreciate you working with me on this important bill. And our updated text will be reflected in the ANS I will offer today. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. LaHood and Mr. Issa for their work on a bipartisan resolution, continued solidarity with the Lebanese people after the devastating explosions at the port of Beirut last August. Their resolution also highlights Iran and Hezbollah's destructive, destabilizing activities in Lebanon. And it's important to show bipartisan support for their continued efforts to form a secure, independent, and democratic Lebanon. I'm proud to be uh, the lead co-sponsor on several measures of today's markup. Uh, Chairman Meek's Burma Act. Uh, Representative Jacobs' resolution calling for stability in northern Mozambique and condemning ISIS-affiliated terrorists, and Representative Bass's resolution condemning all violence and human rights abuses in Ethiopia. Just within the last few days, the fighting in northern Ethiopia has intensified. The humanitarian need is catastrophic. The people are dying of starvation, going days without food, and some have resorted to eating leaves. The Ethiopian government must allow food trucks, fuel, and medical supplies to enter Tigray, and response efforts need to expand into the Afar and the Amhara regions. In my assessment, the horrific reports that have emerged, including the discovery of mass graves and the use of rape and starvation as weapons of war, 
are just the tip of the iceberg of the atrocities that have been committed. Innocent civilians are paying the price of this brutal war, and all sides are guilty. The fighting must stop immediately. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to talk about one measure uh, that uh, is not on today's markup. Our members requested that this committee consider House Resolution 701, a resolution of inquiry to seek specific information on the Biden administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan. Since mid-August, I've sent the administration seven letters seeking specific facts and information about the Afghanistan withdrawal and its aftermath. I still have not received any satisfactory responses to my questions. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, resolutions of inquiry have been a privileged oversight tool for over 200 years. According to the House rule in place since 1879, once filed, they are entitled to a prompt committee markup. And they are a tool regularly used by the minority, including by many House Democrats during the prior administration. So uh, I was disappointed to learn that Democrat leaders quietly threw the centuries-old precedent out the window, protecting the Biden administration from answering basic questions about their many self-inflicted crises. They did this by burying it in a rule that they have quietly and repeatedly extended. This committee has a long history of prioritizing national security over politics, of working together in a bipartisan fashion. There is bipartisan support for a full and vigorous investigation into what caused the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. I appreciate the hearing we had with Secretary Blinken and your request for his dissent cable, Mr. Chairman, and I hope we can do more on this. Um, I wish this resolution could have been included uh, in today's markup. I hope we may be able to consider it in the future. And in closing, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit for today's record the text of the resolution of inquiry introduced by 23 members of this committee on October the 5th. Without objection. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Let me just quickly respond to the Ranking Member. Uh, I, I note that the Ranking Member is uh, raising his resolution of inquiry in his opening remarks, and I really appreciate his desire to conduct oversight on Afghanistan, uh, in particular on the withdrawal that unfolded on August of 2021. Uh, and this committee will certainly continue to assess those uh, 20 days. But uh, I also hope that we can also acknowledge the strategic failure in Afghanistan wasn't simply about those 20 days in August, but rather about the past 20 years of our involvement in the country and any honest or credible review of the withdrawal and evacuation efforts must also include a broader look at the years of Afghanistan policy. And I just also want to be clear that this committee will continue its oversight work, work that we began even prior to the President's announcement this past April that the United States would follow through on withdrawal of troops from uh, Afghanistan. Lastly, I also think it's important for the record to show that in this Congress alone, uh, House leadership and this committee have held more than 30 member or staff level briefings and hearings, unclassified and classified, with current and former uh, administration officials, with international organizations, and outside experts on Afghanistan. And there are more to come. And I am compelled to point out that the ranking member's ROR, you know, that I wish uh, it had not happened in the past. It is in favor of the Republican leadership to conduct rigorous oversight during the previous administration, including the deal the former president had with the Taliban. Let me uh, also uh, say that oversight is at the heart of this committee's activities. And moving forward, we will continue our critical oversight function. So with that, I now recognize members of the committee by seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans for the purpose of speaking on the in block package. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will come back to you. I now recognize Representative Brad Sherman for five minutes.
You're on mute, Mr. Sh Mr. Sherman. You're on mute. Do we have a we can't hear you, Mr. Sherman. We will come back to you. We'll come back to Mr. Sherman. Let me yield now to Representative uh, Ted Deutsch of Florida, the chair of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and global counterterrorism. Maybe having problems. All right, as we try to resolve the problems of audio, we'll go to Representative Karen Bass, who's here, <laughs> who's the chair of California, who's the chair of the subcommittee on Africa, global health, and global human rights. The, the, the benefits of being here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall uh, and the African subcommittee member, Ranking Member Chris Smith for helping to lead this bipartisan ANS to HRES 445, condemning all violence and human rights abuses in Ethiopia and calling for all combatants in the conflict in northern Ethiopia to cease all hostilities, respect human rights, allow unfettered humanitarian access, and cooperate with independent investigations of credible atrocity allegations on all sides. I recently led a quick trip to Ethiopia where Representative Jacobs and I met with Prime Minister Abiy and other government officials and civil society to see how the international community can assist in helping to stop the violence that has killed thousands and left more fleeing their homes. I want to reiterate that I do not believe that there is a military solution to this conflict, and I am concerned the country is fracturing, fracturing and will only get worse without a national dialogue. I'm also concerned that Ethiopia is in danger of sanctions, uh, from the administration, as well as compromising its ability to participate in, in a Goa if the violence continues. While in Ethiopia, I met not only with the Prime Minister and members of the Cabinet, but also with the Ethiopia Human Rights Commission, the UN Special Envoy, Envoy for the Home of Horn of Africa, and, and, and the Ethiopian Parliament, the International Committee of the Red Cross, YALI Fellows, and the Chamber of Commerce. Representative Jacobs and I wanted to hear all sides on the issue on the ground and articulate that the only way forward is negotiated peace. No one ethnic group or party can say that they are winning during this conflict. It is bad for people's welfare and the country overall. This conflict is also hurting the country's economy and negatively affecting the ability to conduct business. It is also having a post-traumatic effect on young people and people in general that are deeply disturbed by the conflict and violence and just want their country to return to peace. The conflict in the Tigray region alone has forced 60,000 Ethiopians to seek safety in Sudan. 24,000 across the country are suffering from food insecurity, 24 million. Ethiopia has always been a pillar of the continent and a key contributor to advancing peace and security across the region. While visiting the country, I also urge the government to allow humanitarian assistance into the country, particularly in Tigray, and let workers do their jobs without harassment or threat of violence. Like some of my colleagues on this committee, I have a large Ethiopian diaspora in my district in California, and I've tried to hear all sides of the situation and I am fully aware that all stakeholders have a part in contributing to the conflict in the country. I want to lead this resolution because I want to see a peaceful resolution to this multifaceted conflict that is complicated by ethnicity, politics, history, and a desire for power. The resolution calls for the immediate cessation of the violence between all combatants in the conflict in Ethiopia. It denounces the harassment and intimidation of journalists and aid, aid workers and the expulsion of senior UN officials responsible for supporting humanitarian response efforts. It urges the government of Ethiopia to cooperate with independent and transparent investigations of all human rights abuses and atrocities committed by all sides in the course of the conflict in northern Ethiopia and immediately granting full and unfeathered humanitarian access for personnel and supplies 
including necessary commodities like fuel and medicine into areas affected by the conflict. Uh, it is reported that there needs to be as many as 100 trucks a day going into the Tigrayan region. What we learned while we were there is that less than 10 trucks a day go, but also many of the trucks are not returned. And so the trucks need to be returned from the Tigrayan region uh, as well. Um, I, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to speak on another bipartisan resolution led by my uh, friend from California, Representative Jacobs, HRES 720, calling for stability and the cessation of violence and condemning the ISIS-affiliated terrorist activity in northern Mozambique. Uh, the resolution, among, uh, among other things, encourages the government of Mozambique to ensure humanitarian workers have access to vulnerable populations where the violence is, is constant. And I ask my colleague to support this resolution and all the other resolutions in block. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights for five minutes. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, August 2018, Aaron Bass and I traveled to Ethiopia together, met with Prime Minister Abe, who was in the beginning of his term, uh, and were greatly impressed with the leadership he was showing. He obviously got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and what a difference a couple of years have made. There are serious problems now in Ethiopia, as we all know, and HRES 445, authored by Karen, uh, condemns all violence and human rights abuses in Ethiopia and seeks accountability and hopefully reconciliation. Ethiopia, as we all, all know, is a great nation dating back thousands of years. Ethiopia is ethnically and religiously diverse, and its diaspora has deeply enriched life in the United States. It is also of great strategic importance, located as it is in the Horn of Africa and as a gateway to Eastern and Central Africa. It is the source of the Blue Nile, which has brought it into conflict with Egypt. Because of its location and outside significance, it is being targeted by radical Islamists and the Chinese Communist Party. As we speak, Ethiopia is a country on the verge of implosion. Today's resolution, which has been worked on meticulously by Chairwoman Bass, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and me, reflects changes that have taken place in Ethiopia since the conflict began in Tigray province in November of last year. This urgent resolution strives to be even-handed and recognizes the fact that much of Ethiopia is currently in a profound state of unrest, not simply Tigray. It recognizes all bad actors, not simply singling out <clears throat> the Ethiopian government and the Amhara regional government, but also the Oromo Liberation Army and the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF. The TPLF, of course, governed Ethiopia with a very heavy hand for decades under the strong arm rule of Prime Minister Meles and bears an enormous responsibility for the unrest we see unfolding now. First, because it created a system of ethnic federalism, which created regional states divided upon ethnic lines that has inevitably led to discord and ethnic cleansing. Second, because the TPLF participated, uh, pre precipitated the immediate crisis, as the resolution acknowledges, by leading an attack on the Northern Command of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. And third, after the Ethiopian government had declared a unilateral ceasefire by ignoring it and taking the conflict into Amhara and Afar states. I would note parenthetically back in 2005, uh, I visited with President Mellis uh, after he had a, an egregiously flawed election uh, and then introduced the, the um, uh, human rights bill to hold him and his government accountable. Uh, Don Payne, who was in my ranking member, uh, joined me in that, and we did together get the bill passed in the House. Unfortunately, it died in the Senate. The resolution also recognizes that just as each group in Ethiopia has its share of victimizers, each group does have its share of victims, whether from Tigray, Amhara, Oromo, Ogden, or Afar, the list goes on. This is one of the great tragedies of Ethiopia. Inter-ethnic violence as well as intra-ethnic violence, it threatens to shatter this great diverse nation. Mr. Chairman, and according to the World Food Program, a report issued this month, there are now 1.7 million people facing emergency levels of hunger in the Afar and Amhara regions, and over 700,000 in Amhara and 140,000 in Afar being displaced. 
HJ, H Res 445 calls for the cessation of all hostilities, unfettered humanitarian access and respect for human rights, and calls for independent investigations of credible atrocity allegations. I also want to express briefly my strong support for HRES 569, authored by Mr. LaHood, expressing continued solidarity with the Lebanese people after the devastating explosions in the port of Beirut on August 4th, 2020, which ultimately resulted in the death of 218 individuals and wounded an estimated 7,000. Some estimates say that one half of the city of Beirut was damaged. Accordingly, HRES 569 calls on Lebanon to perform a thorough and transparent investigation into the tragedy and hold those responsible accountable. It presses Lebanon to continue efforts to build the rule of law and respect fundamental rights. And it, it calls for combating terrorist groups like Hezbollah, ISIS, uh, and Al-Qaeda. In particular, the resolution is important because it does condemn Hezbollah, which backed by Iran is responsible for so much of what afflicts Lebanon and also threatens our good friend and ally, Israel. I yield back the balance of my time and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Brad Sherman of California for five minutes. I rise in support of the UNBLOC and all four measures included in it. I commend Mr. LaHood for bringing forward the uh, resolution in support of our solidarity with the Lebanese people and uh, in a secure, independent, and democratic Lebanon. I commend uh, Sarah Jacobs uh, for her resolution condemning the ISIS-affiliated terrorist activities in northern Mozambique. Uh, I commend uh, the chairman for so many things, but including his uh, Burma Act, uh, an act that I have co-sponsored uh, not only uh, today, but in prior Congresses. It is uh, tragic to see what is happening in Burma, uh, what the government uh, there calls Myanmar, uh, and we do need to react to twin tragedies. One is the loss of democracy um, with uh, the uh, 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 Tad Ma Da uh, taking over, and it is entirely appropriate, as this uh, resolution provides, or as this bill provides, that we stop the importation of precious and semi-precious gemstones that we create a special coordinator for uh, Burmese democracy, that we work multinationally to impose uh, sanctions on uh, the Myanmar Burma regime. Uh, but we cannot speak of uh, Burma or Myanmar without also focusing on the Rohingya people. And that is why this, uh, this bill also calls for the State Department to issue a genocide determination uh, the, uh, the government of uh, Myanmar, Burma ha must, if it wishes to continue to have international support in exercising sovereignty on the uh, Rakhine state, uh, show that it is willing to defend uh, 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 the people who live there and have a right to live there. And that certainly includes the, Ro the Rohingya. It starts by giving them full citizenship documentation and protecting them rather than exposing them to violence. And finally, we have the resolution on Ethiopia, on Tigray. Uh, what we see there is tragic so far. We see 70 or 80,000 Tigrayans who have fled to Sudan, and we have to do everything we can to help them. But we see millions of Tigrayans who face death from starvation and attendant diseases. And we see a blockade of Tigray not even allowing in UN food and medicine. The bodies we see in the river are just the tip of the iceberg. We could be seeing millions of deaths. That is why this bill calls also for the State Department to determine whether we are witnessing a genocide in Tigray. Uh, this is why the United States must uh, provide the diplomatic tools to move toward uh, a ceasefire and uh, why we must encourage the African uh, Union and other regional partners to play a role in mediating this crisis. But first and foremost is the urgent delivery of humanitarian aid. 
and nothing is more outrageous than the blockade of the trucks trying to get in. We do need to explore bringing in humanitarian aid by air, whether it be by landing the planes or dropping the aid, but that is a small, but we can only bring in a small portion of the aid that's necessary. We need the trucks. What is perhaps most outrageous is the uh, Eritrean blockade of the border between Tigray and Sudan. We need, uh, I'm reluctant to expose American armed forces to risk of, uh, uh, to, uh, to their uh, safety at any time. But the American Navy could interrupt uh, Eritrean commerce on the high seas at any time. And it would certainly be just to do so as long as Eritrea blockades humanitarian aid to the people of Tigray. So we need to pass this bill now, but we need to look at more forceful actions as well to make sure that while we deal with the politics of northern Ethiopia, we at least make sure that we are not witnessing another Rwanda, another near genocide or genocide, another mass starv or, or a mass starvation event. And for the cross-border uh, terrorism or cross-border interdiction of n critically needed humanitarian uh, uh, assistance to be carried out by Eritrean uh, forces is simply outrageous, and there is something we can do about it without undue risk to our forces. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Votes have been called on the House floor. I believe we have two votes on the House floor. So the committee will stand in recess until after House votes. Right. No. Okay. I've already missed two votes this uh,
Mr. Chairman. All right, when you're ready, sir, please count down from five before gaveling. Five, four, three, two, one. Committee will now come into session. I now recognize Representative Steve Shabbat, Ohio, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it has already been mentioned that uh, we have a number of very good bills before us today, including uh, Mr. Issa and Mr. LaHood's resolution on the uh, worsening situation in, in Lebanon and Ranking Member McCall's bill on uh, Havana Syndrome and a number of others. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to uh, focus my remarks on H.R. 5497, the Burma Act legislation, which you, Mr. Chairman, and I introduced in response uh, to the worsening situation uh, in Burma. Let me begin with some history about this legislation. Back in uh, September of 2017, the Burmese military began a genocidal campaign to permanently drive the Rohingya out of Burma, which resulted in over 700,000 Rohingya refugees fleeing from Rakhine State Burma into neighboring Bangladesh. They remain there today uh, without any realistic or meaningful hope, at this point at least, of returning home. Uh, this campaign consisted of widespread, systematic, and premeditated human rights abuses, uh, it, horrific stuff, including barbaric killings, uh, gang rapes, and the burning of around 400 Rohingya villages. According to a partial State Department report on these atrocities, about half of the Rohingya surveyed said that they had personally witnessed a rape, while about 80% had witnessed personally killings and the destruction of villages. In response to these atrocities, then-ranking member Elliot Engel and I crafted uh, the predecessor of this legislation, which would have imposed sanctions on the military and deployed several other tools to address longstanding concerns about Burma. Uh, while the legislation passed in the House several times, the Senate failed to take it up. Fast forward to February 1st of this year, and as everyone here knows, the Burmese military seized control in a coup and detained Aung San Suu Kyi and President Nguyen Myint, uh, several other NLD elected officials, and a signif significant number of innocent uh, civilians. The generals have seized power before, uh, but this time the response has been different. The people of Burma, who come from all walks of life, from students to doctors to government workers to farmers, have courageously stood up against the military uh, with peaceful protests and mass strikes and other civil disobedience. The military's response has been predictably brutal. Uh, the crackdown has uh, thus far killed over 1,000 people and left over 7,000 in prison. Uh, this repression has pushed the country towards civil war. Uh, as the general stubbornly refused to restore democracy. This coup is a blatant violation of the rights of the Burmese people. Self-government is not some sort of temporary arrangement or gift from the military. It's a right that's owed to the people of Burma. The generals cannot simply back out of democracy when it no longer serves their purposes. We updated the Burma uh, Act to provide some measure of accountability for both the genocide back in 2017 and this year's coup, and to reflect the sanctions the Biden administration has already imposed on the Burmese military. The new version of the legislation will levy stronger sanctions and provide additional assistance to the people of Burma. Mr. Chairman, this legislation could go a long way toward putting Burma back on the path towards democracy. It's way overdue that we enact legislation to sanction the Burmese military for its many crimes. So I would urge my colleagues to support this critical legislation. And before I close, I'd like to mention just two other things. First, uh, as I've said many times before, we need to take seriously, very seriously, the challenge of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and, and it's clear that the Commerce Department, uh, unfortunately, uh, isn't acting up to where they need to be. A few days ago, uh, China, for example, uh, tested a game-changing uh, hypersonic missile. 
Uh, they got the technology from us. So I would like to associate myself with the comments of the ranking member McCall. Uh, the PRC is getting more and more dangerous and we cannot afford to have anyone involved in our national security effort that's not operating at peak performance. To me, uh, it sounds like someone uh, was asleep at the switch considering that this missile took uh, virtually everybody by surprise. Uh, and like Ranking Member McCall, uh, I also want to address an item uh, before I close that we are not marking up today. And that's the, at the beginning of this month, uh, Mr. McCall and a lot of us, including myself, introduced HRS 701, a resolution of inquiry, uh, seeking information from the administration regarding uh, the Afghan withdrawal debacle and the decision making behind this national disgrace. Such a resolution is supposed to be privileged either here in committee or on the floor. Unfortunately, Speaker Pelosi is so scared of proper oversight of the Biden administration that the Rules Committee has turned off uh, the privilege for resolutions of inquiry, a privilege that's existed for about 200 years. Uh, we have a constitutional oversight responsibility, this committee does, uh, and on this score, the majority is failing to fulfill its duty uh, to the American people. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Sarah Jacobs of California, who is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global corporate social impact for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for supporting my resolution calling for stability and the cessation of violence in northern Mozambique. My team and I actually did some research and found out that this is the first time the committee has marked up legislation on Mozambique since the year 2000, which just so happened to be your resolution, Mr. Chair, so I am proud that we are shining a light on the situation in the country today. I also want to thank Chairwoman Bass and Congresswoman Kim for partnering with me. This bipartisan resolution not only condemns the violence perpetrated by ISIS Mozambique against civilians and children, but also calls attention to the underlying grievances fueling violent extremism in northern Mozambique, including human rights violations by security forces, state corruption, and historical socioeconomic marginalization in Cabo Delgado. It urges the government of Mozambique to address the conflict and restore security in a manner that respects civilians and human rights and encourages donor governments to consider this in their support as well. We need to make sure our approach and the international community's approach is not just through a counterterrorism lens, but is actually taking a comprehensive approach to address the conflict. And this resolution calls on us to do just that. If we're serious about calling for an end to this violence, we need to get serious about the factors that are driving it. I'm proud to lead this important resolution and I urge my colleagues to support it. I'd also like to speak on Chairwoman Bass's resolution on Ethiopia. I, like many of my colleagues, have been following the devastating conflict and humanitarian crisis in Northern Ethiopia that began in Tigray over the past several months and it's heartbreaking. I recently traveled to Ethiopia with Chairwoman Bass and I can say that this conflict is extremely complicated with a lot of legitimate historical grievances from all parties. This resolution takes the important step of recognizing the horrific atrocities taking place and urging for perpetrators to immediately seize violence against civilians. I'd also like to recognize and condemn the recent military airstrikes against Tigray's capital, Mekele, which has reportedly resulted in the loss of civilian lives, including children. We are also increasingly seeing deteriorating human humanitarian situations in both Afar and Amhara with enduring challenges with humanitarian access and mass internal displacement. The people of Ethiopia are suffering. Lives are ending need needlessly and the violence must stop. I thank the chairwoman for her leadership on this issue and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The balance of her time. Would the gentle, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, would the gentlelady yield to me? This is Mr. Connolly. Sure. I thank the gentlelady. Um, <clears throat> and I certainly support the package in front of us today. I just wanted to respond both to Mr. McCall and Mr. Shabbat in their comments about a privileged resolution with respect to the evacuation of Kabul. Um, it, you know, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If we're going to do that, we're going to have a resolution that looks at the catastrophic decisions made by the Trump administration in Doha, Qatar, that led directly to the downfall of 
uh, of Afghanistan's military and government and to the release of 5,000 prisoners, including many terrorists. Uh, so uh, there will be such a resolution so that we make sure we're looking at the full context of what happened in, uh, in Afghanistan and that we hold everyone who was responsible accountable. I thank my friend for yielding. I yield. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Capital Council Terrorism for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Greg Meeks and Ranking Member Mike McCall for your efforts to bring these bipartisan measures before the committee today. I support House Resolution 569. On August 4, 2020, a massive explosion of improperly stored ammonium nitrate at the port of Beirut killed over 200 individuals and devastated nearby high-density housing and infrastructure. I received a call about the explosion from a former staff member who was living in Lebanon who thankfully was not home in her nearby apartment, which was devastated at the time of the disaster. Evidence indicates that officials who were made aware of the improper storage uh, posing a risk well before the explosion occurred. This speaks further to the corruption and negligence in Lebanon as the country spirals further into economic crisis. It is concerning that officials refuse to meet the needs of the Lebanese people calling for transparency, basic human rights, and the end of corruption. Sadly, the new Lebanese government does not inspire confidence especially with Hezbollah increasing dominance over the cabinet and state institutions, including the very vital Lebanese armed forces. On a visit to Beirut, I have been inspired by meeting so many dedicated patriots of the country. And in my home state of South Carolina, the citizens of Lebanese heritage are valued leaders in business, government, and community service. That's why the people of Lebanon deserve better. We should support maintaining and expanding sanctions against the Iranian-backed Hezbollah and its allies, the Biden administration, green lighting of the Egyptian pipeline into Lebanon, benefiting the brutal Assad regime, will do nothing to ease the suffering of the people of Lebanon and will benefit Assad and the Iranian-backed Hezbollah, which threatens Israel with additional rocket attacks. President Biden should recognize the threat to Israel and America by Hezbollah, Iran, and Assad. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing these bills. I'm a co-sponsor of a number of them, and I support the rest. I want to also thank uh, Chairwoman Bass for her leadership on the House Resolution 445. And thank her for allowing me to work with her on this because I have a lot of constituents who are interested in this outcome. Since the Ethiopian conflict began in November 2020, international efforts to quell the violence really have been less than fruitful. And as you have heard from others, this week just proved and showed that the situation is worsening and the violence is escalating. This serves as a first step, but it can't be the last in confronting the brutality that's been perpetuated by all sides in this conflict. I strongly condemn the use of military strikes against civilian population centers throughout the country. And I hope that the Ethiopian prime minister and his allied Eritrean forces, along with representatives from the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, will cease the hostilities and come together to meet at the negotiating table. That's the only way we'll get a solution is if they're involved in coming up with what works best for all parties. Even before the start of the recent conflict, Ethiopia was struggling with one of Africa's largest internally displaced populations. And the continued violence throughout the country, along with COVID, have just exasperated the situation. So along with my colleagues on this committee, I strongly urge the Ethiopian government to allow humanitarian relief into the country. Uh, let it come in unencumbered. And I hope that we'll see that that is distributed fairly uh, and that we'll see an end to the hostility soon. Uh, and I thank you very much for your time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. 
I now recognize Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Meeks. I want to echo the remarks made by the ranking member on the resolution of inquiry regarding Afghanistan. I do believe it's an important piece of legislation, and given the horrific nature of our withdrawal from Afghanistan, Afghanistan a withdrawal so successful that hundreds of Americans are still stranded in that country as far as we know. And of course, billions of dollars in premier military equipment left to what is now a terrorist super state. Congressional oversight is absolutely the first thing that is needed. It's absolutely beyond me how there's been nobody in the Biden administration that's been held accountable for this. And while my good friend from Virginia would like to change history as he always does, we're not gonna let him, we're not gonna let anybody um, just disregard the fact that the commander in chief at the time of this occurrence is Joe Biden, not Donald Trump. And Joe Biden had every ability and authority to do whatever he wanted to do regarding that withdrawal and, and every failure is one that he owns. Now, according to the Luger Center, the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, our committee, has a projected grade of an F for oversight. I don't think anybody's proud of that, but I do think it's a result of exactly zero investigative oversight hearings. That's something the American people should know about. This committee ranks among the lowest of the low for House committees in relation to its oversight responsibilities. This committee is simply not interested in oversight and the lack of hearings on Afghanistan in recent weeks has only indicated a dug-in approach to defend this administration's failure at any cost. I urge my colleagues on this committee to stop their intransigence and focus on obtaining as much information on the botched withdrawal of Afghanistan. Our veterans deserve answers and accountability, and so do the American people. In the remaining time, as some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle refuse to bring up legislation that will effectively counter the existential threat that the People's Republic of China poses to our country, I wish to bring up two pieces of legislation that will effectively keep the PRC in check. The first is H.R. 5431, that designated the CCP as a transnational organized crime group. The Chinese Communist Party is an aggressive criminal organization, and while it's taken far too long, Americans are finally clearly seeing the threat posed by the CCP to the health, security, and prosperity of the United States. The Communist Party of China continues to be heavily involved in drug trafficking, including fentanyl trafficking. They continue to commit an ongoing grotesque genocide of their very own people, and they continue to lie about the origins of the coronavirus and obstruct international efforts to learn more about that. The CCP steals up to $600 billion annually in intellectual property, Theft from the United States alone. Forced technology transfers accounts for anywhere between $180 billion to $540 billion in lost revenue to our national economy. Top of all this, they regularly engage in espionage activities. Last year, we arrested two Chinese military agents at the Houston Consulate for attempted theft of coronavirus vaccine research. The State Department has since confirmed that the Chinese consulates in more than two dozen U.S. cities are helping Communist Party soldiers posing as students spy on our colleagues, and we're asleep at the switch here. My legislation would apply the RICO Act to the CCP and designate them for the top international criminal organization target, or TICOT, list. It is beyond time we've held the CCP accountable for who they are. They are a transnational organized crime organization. The second bill I wish to discuss today likely has a much better chance of bipartisan consensus, and that is the Taiwan Plus Act. This bill would provide Taiwan with temporary NATO Plus status alongside some of our nation's greatest allies and would foster a strong deterrence posture against the evil CCP regime that has made every indication of their intentions to violate Taiwan's sovereignty. My hope is that this measure bill will earn bipartisan support. The United States of America will always stand shoulder to shoulder with our friends in Taiwan. With that, I look forward to debating the legislating before, legislation before up in this markup, and I yield back the balance. Gentlemen yields back the balance. Uh, I will now recognize Representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina, who's the Vice Chair of Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Ter Counterterrorism. Uh, let me ask Ms. Manning whether she would yield 10 seconds to me. Of course. Yes, I just want to respond to Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry, I have in front of me uh, the 117th HFAC Afghan engagements. 
uh, I'm sure to give them to you, where there's 43 occasions of such meetings that we've held in this hearing oversighting Afghanistan. I yield back to Ms. Manning. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCall for your leadership and for the committee's excellent work on all these important measures. I am proud to join my colleagues as an original co-sponsor of H.R. 5497, the Burma Unified Through Rigorous Military Accountability, or Burma Act, bipartisan legislation introduced by Chairman Meeks and Congressman Chabot. This legislation imposes targeted sanctions on military officials responsible for the February 2021 coup, which deposed Burma's democratically elected government. Within days, the world witnessed thousands of citizens pouring out of the streets in protest, calling for an end to military rule and the release of elected leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi. They were met with a brutal, violent crackdown. Since February, security forces have killed more than 1,100 people and arrested more than 9,000. Many of the junta forces are the same ones responsible for the campaign against the Rohingya Muslims. Since August 2017, more than 730,000 Rohingya Muslims have fled Burma's Rakhine state to escape the military's large-scale assault, with many fleeing to neighboring Bangladesh to escape killings, arson, and other mass atrocities. Under Burmese law, the Rohingya are denied citizenship and have faced decades of oppression and discrimination. Roughly 600,000 Rohingya Muslims remain in Burma, facing dire and worsening humanitarian conditions. This bill will impose targeted sanctions on the Burmese military, the State Administrative Council, and affiliates responsible for the coup and the ongoing crackdown in Burma. It will establish a U.S. Special Coordinator for Burmese Democracy to make sure the United States remains at the forefront of helping to promote human rights and restore civilian government in Burma. And it will require state to make a determination about the genocide against the Rohingya. Additionally, the bill calls for the immediate and unconditional release of Danny Fenster, an American journalist from my hometown of Detroit who is represented by our colleague, Congressman Andy Levin, and who has been unjustly detained since May, as well as all other journalists unjustly detained. We continue to hope that Danny will be able to come home soon. Mr. Chairman, this bipartisan bill will crack down on those who threaten democracy and human rights in Burma. This is an important, comprehensive bill to hold accountable those responsible for gross violations of human rights, freedom of assembly, and freedom of the press. And I look forward to seeing it become law. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. I now recognize Representative Dara Issa of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I won't use the whole five minutes. I want to uh, thank uh, you and Rep Representative Bass and Jacobs and the, uh, the team, and the, plus, of course, the ranking member and his team uh, for this thoughtful M Block package. Included in it uh, is uh, HRES 569. And I want to thank you and all the members of the committee and the committee staff for working on such a bipartisan basis to refine a resolution that deals with describing a country on the brink of being a failed state one in which the United States has made many years of peaceful investment in the Lebanese armed forces and other institutions. Unlike Afghanistan and other nations, Lebanon will not fall from without. If it falls, it will fall from within. It'll fall because we failed to fight corruption. We failed to support the law enforcement capabilities and the stabilizing capabilities of the uh, LAF. Additionally, we have made commitments to that country to help them as they continue to battle foreign influence, including the influence from Iran. And Mr. Chairman, uh, as a, a, a member of what is often called the diaspora of Lebanon, I take special pride that Lebanon has been a successful melting pot for many years, but in the last few weeks, we have seen the beginning of sectarian violence, the beginning of the breakdown. So now more than ever, 
this resolution and the continued support by the United States to the institutions that can curb or head off another terrible civil war has never been more important. And I know that for all the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle, recognizing that as Iran continues to put its thumb on one side of the scale in the Palestinian territories, particularly Gaza, put one side on the scale in Lebanon, put one side on the scale in Syria, now more than ever, it's important that this committee say America will put its thumb on the other side of the scale to provide justice for a people who want peace in the region. And again, I'll be supporting the entire end block, but I want to thank both you and Chairman or Ranking Member McCall for your support and leadership, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Jim Costa of California for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I hope uh, you can uh, hear me clearly. I want to thank you and the committee for um, this hearing. Uh, I support all of these pieces of legislation. I think it's important, as you have said uh, repeatedly, that the House Foreign uh, Relations Committee uh, uh, assert itself on issues and challenges facing our country around the world and these resolutions and these efforts I think uh, put us on record, uh, but obviously there are more that we have to do. Uh, and to the degree we can do it on a bipartisan basis, uh, we're uh, all, I think, much better off to trying to return to a, a point at some day where a lot of our politics end at water's edge. I think the resolution 445 condemning the violence and human rights abuses in Ethiopia and Taria and the, the, the combatants and the conflicts in northern Ethiopia. Uh, it is a tragedy what has taken place there and the respect for human rights and unfettered access to um, allow the United Nation, nations and others to perform humanitarian access and cooperate and also to investigate the, uh, the independent uh, efforts to the incredible atrocities that we have heard that have taken place. So I think this resolution is certainly in the in the right direction. Um, in addition to that, uh, also within the continent of Africa, the situation in Mozambique, I think concerns many of us who are familiar with the situation. Um, uh, this the necessity for stability and cessation of violence um, is in the uh, Cabo Delgado province. Um, is uh, important to recognize, and um, I want to thank um, the authors for this effort in, 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 in keeping in our efforts to maintain a spotlight and attention on that effort. Um, and um, I um, want to um, uh, thank the chairman and the ranking member for their efforts on trying to put this together in a bipartisan effort. And um, clearly, we have a lot to do. Um, the Savannah Syndrome, I think, concerns all of us. Uh, American diplomats are uh, uh, where the rubber meets the road around the world to uh, represent our nation and to do so in a way that uh, um, allows us to um, uh, allow the rest of the world to know that we are engaged in all of these efforts within their countries. When our diplomats are being uh, singularly uh, singled out in ways in which their health is is uh, compromised are there in efforts uh, being uh, attacked we've got to get to the bottom of this and clearly um, i think it's uh, behooves all of us to join together in uh, supporting those americans who have committed their careers and their livelihoods to representing our country around the world so with that said, I, uh, as I indicated, I support these measures and I look forward to continuing to work with the committee uh, on our efforts to um, <clears throat> ensure that the United States of America uh, lets the rest of the world know that uh, our, our willingness to provide leadership is, is consistent and hopefully bipartisan. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time and I thank you very much. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the effort by the chairman, ranking member, and staff to put together this unblocked package. 
uh, for several important reasons, though I must oppose the unblock package. And the two reasons are one having to do with the Burma Act and number ha two having to do with the failure to include uh, the ROI into this, into this unblock package. And I want to start with the Burma Act and something that I believe we need to address moving forward as a committee in, in many different places. Uh, if you look at our ability to get dollars sent to domestic projects here, most of us would, would kill to be able to get projects funded in our communities domestically for three, four, five, six, seven years on end to, to be able to have mi tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars go to projects like that. But we can't get that done domestically here. But internationally, in the Burma Act, in what has been described just in the last few minutes as a worsening situation and a country on the, on the brink of failure, <clears throat> We're going to, number one, give away our negotiating leverage by authorizing appropriations to them for half a decade. In the shadow of having just raised our nation's debt limit, we're going to do that. And then you look beyond that and, and to say, why would we, we give a nation on the brink of failure millions and millions and millions of dollars year after year without evaluating that each year. And, and I think that would be a fair ask for anything that we do as it goes to international appropriations, that we look at that year over year. That would be not being a, asleep at the wheel, not putting on an autopilot. Uh, the, the same thing that we do domestically with spending. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I have to oppose this unblock package. We just we can't allow spending like that to be on autopilot, even amid the the devastating situation of what's going on uh, within Burma. As it relates to the the ROI, and I'm always happy to yield to people, as as folks know in this committee. Uh, if somebody in here disagrees with making sure that we ensure all documents or all records, communications, correspondence, emails, text messages, instant messages, transcripts, summaries, agendas, notes, diplomatic cables, reports, meeting readouts. If any member of this committee would like to speak against retaining those items as it relates to the withdrawal of Afghanistan from Afghanistan, I got two minutes here that I'm happy to yield to somebody if they want to say we shouldn't be retaining those items. It's a fair demand from this committee. The, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned in the, the opening of your remarks that oversight is at the heart of this committee. If it's at the heart of this committee, then put it at the heart of this committee. And let's make sure that, that we retain those documents for bipartisan purposes. I've aired my grievances on the unblock package, but since I have a minute 30 remaining, I'll sit here and wait and see if anybody has a problem with retaining all documents, records, communications, correspondence, emails, transcripts, texts and instant messages, summaries of agendas, notes, diplomatic cables, meeting readouts, other things as it relates to what happened with the disastrous Afghanistan hostage crisis, Afghanistan withdrawal, leaving Americans behind, green card holders behind, those that aided us for the last couple decades behind. Mr. Chairman, having sat here for a, a little bit, I see that nobody seems to have an objection to that. Uh, I can commit for myself that I would certainly be willing to stay for as long as it takes uh, to include uh, the ROI into our unblock package or whatever we would need to do to, to continue to get that marked up uh, as it is urgent and uh, should be done probably weeks ago, but not done yet to this point. I'm certainly happy to commit to staying if you want to get that done yet today. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired.
I now recognize Representative David Cicilline of Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCall for holding this markup as we consider key legislation across the spectrum of foreign policy challenges facing the United States and its partners around the globe. Once again, the members of this committee have the opportunity to come together to support human rights, the rule of law, and democracy in regions around the world. In particular, Mr. Chairman, we can join together to support your legislation, H.R. 5497, the Burma Act of 2021, so that we may rightly punish those who have overthrown the will of the Burmese people, and so they, they may, we may empower our diplomats with the tools they need to build international support for rejecting the legitimacy of the Tatmandaw's coup. Since the Tatmandaw overthrew the democratic elected national unity government in February, 1,100 Burmese citizens have been killed, many of them from the Karen and Rohingya peoples that have been targeted because of their religious beliefs. Those resisting the Tatmandaw and protesting on behalf of democratic values and pluralism have faced a violent crackdown that threatens lives and a long-term prospect of human rights and the rule of law in Myanmar. The Burma Act of 2021 would create sanction regime against the Tatmandaw, the State Administrative Council, and other responsible parties that represent a strong, proportionate response to their deliberate sabotaging of Burmese democracy. It would also create a badly needed office within the State Department that will be tasked with building international support for broader global sanctions. The situation at hand requires an international coalition unabashedly opposed to the aims of the Tatmandaw. Strong U.S. leadership can help build that coalition. The Tatmandaw may have wrestled control of the Burmese government away from the people of Myanmar. They may have jailed and killed many that opposed their rule. And while they continue to trample on the will of the Burmese people, resistance strengthens with each passing day. As they continue their reign of terror, the Tatmandaw inadvertently helps build bridges across the diverse peoples of Myanmar, creating a hardened opposition that rejects their illegitimate rule. I saw firsthand the strength of the Burmese people when I traveled to Burma and Bangladesh in November of 2017. There we bore witness to the discrimination, segregation, and horrific violence being committed against the Rohingya community, particularly as we heard firsthand accounts of the savage treatment and brutality that was visited upon the Rohingya community. And today, as we bear witness to the Tatmandaw's cruelty, we must act. And so I urge my colleagues to join me in enthusiastically supporting H.R. 5497 and the other bills in the en bloc package. I'd also like to spend a moment to speak in support of my colleague, Congresswoman Jacobs' resolution, House Res 720, calling for stability and cessation of violence in Mozambique. I'm proud to co-sponsor this bill, which calls on the government of Mozambique to end the violence created by ISIS Mozambique and to provide humanitarian support to those who need it. And I thank my colleague for her strong leadership on that uh, piece of legislation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always a pleasure seeing you. Um, I would really like to stress my support for Ranking Member McCall's House Resolution 701, the Afghanistan Rebel Resolution of Inquiry. And I'd like to echo his sentiments. We need to get to the bottom of what happened with the collapse of the Afghan Republic and the catastrophically botched withdrawal from that country. We need answers. And that is why I'm distressed that my Democratic friends on the Rules Committee have continued to extend the prohibition on resolutions of inquiry becoming privileged resolutions. This is just another example, in my opinion, of slimy, hypocritical D.C. politics, as there were 18 of these resolutions submitted during the first two years of the Trump administration when the Democrats were in the minority. These resolutions have been a very narrowed and tailored oversight mechanism for 200 years, and I can't think of any other current issue more important than Afghanistan, which warrants thorough congressional oversight. We as elected members of Congress should be demanding answers from this administration. I attended the funeral of Staff Sergeant Ryan Canoss at Arlington a few weeks back. His people are neighbors of mine, his parents and grandparents. And he was one of 6,000 soldiers surged into the country to clean up the mess that the Biden administration created. He, also, he was also a constituent and one of 13 brave Americans killed during the coordinated attack where ISIS-K bomber detonated his vest outside the Hamid Khazarai International Airport in August. It is reported that the bomber was released from prison during the Taliban takeover. This resolution seeks all materials relating to important questions myself and many other members of Congress have. 
But most importantly to me, the resolution seeks all materials relating to the release of violent extremists from prisoners in Afghanistan. I want to know what happened and possibly figure out why these prisoners were not secured and transferred to another location. We owe it to the family members of our slain soldiers. I'm proud to support Mr. McCall's resolution, and I urge this committee to take up this important resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the remainder of my time, sir. And I always appreciate your courtesy and friendship. Gentleman's time, gentleman yields back his time. I now recognize Representative Tim Meyer of Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chairman um, and Ranking Member McCall for holding this markup today. As we consider the measures today, there remains one top issue of mine for myself and many of my colleagues, as has been previously stated, and that's the Afghanistan withdrawal and the future of those who were able to evacuate, as well as those who were left behind. The Biden administration's withdrawal was an unmitigated disaster, and too many questions remain unanswered. Since April, a bipartisan group of representatives, myself included, had been imploring this administration to outline their plan to get special immigrant visa eligible individuals out and to clear the backlog of applicants who had served alongside our forces throughout the mission in Afghanistan. In June, as the withdrawal deadline approached, we called for the immediate evacuation of these Afghan allies and their families, again, while there was still time. But our calls were ignored until it was too late. And in August, the world watched in horror as the devastating consequences of this administration's inaction unfolded. We have seen very little transparency or accountability from this administration. House Democratic leadership has helped shield the administration from responsibility by restricting Republicans' ability to submit resolutions of inquiry, a privileged oversight mechanism that has been in use for over 200 years by the minority party to obtain information from the executive branch. Oversight of the executive branch is Congress's fundamental constitutional prerogative. We are demanding answers from the Biden administration on how the withdrawal went so catastrophically wrong so that we can hold those responsible to account and to prevent a similar disaster from ever happening again. I echo the ranking member's call to bring a resolution of inquiry for documents related to the withdrawal up for a vote and urge this committee not to ignore our oversight duties related to Afghanistan. On a separate note, I'm pleased to see that the Burma Act is included in this en bloc. As the representative of a district with a significant Burmese population, I hear frequently about the concerns of my constituents for their family members who are currently suffering at the hands of the Tat Madaw. This bill will impose serious costs on the military regime, which continues to commit grave violations of human rights, including the unjust detention of American citizens. The Burma Act will not only prevent the Tat Madaw from accessing assets that are currently supporting its rule, but also send a strong message of support to the Burmese people that we stand with them and their desire for democracy and human rights. With that, Mr. Chairman, I encourage a yes vote, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Young Kim of California, who's the vice ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Mix and Ranking Member McCall. I stand in support of the unblock being offered today, including Congresswoman Jacobs' resolution on Mozambique, which I am proud to co-lead. The accounts coming out of Cabo Delgado of violent extremists targeting civilians with brutal beheadings, abductions, recruiting child soldiers, and mass killings seriously endanger the stability of Mozambique and the surrounding region. So I join Congresswoman Jacobs in asking this committee to pass this important measure today in condemning the violence by ISIS Mozambique and urging the government there to work with its regional and civil society partners to restore stability and security while ensuring strong protections for human rights and humanitarian aid distribution. The measures before this committee are worthy of speedy passage today, and I'm proud to co-sponsor many of them, including Congresswoman, uh, Congressman Lahoud's important resolution on the Port of Beirut explosion and Ranking Member McCall's critical legislation to develop a robust United States response to the Havana syndrome attacks directed at our diplomatic and intelligence personnel. I'm also proud to co-sponsor Congresswoman Bast resolution on the conflict in Ethiopia, which has claimed so many lives and subjected hundreds of thousands to famine and increasingly unsafe conditions. Congress must act now 
impressing the Biden administration to act with more immediacy and transparency to halt the bloodshed in northern Ethiopia and continue urging all combatants to cease hostilities, respect human rights, and allow unfettered access for humanitarian aid workers. I also call on all sides of this conflict to fully cooperate with independent investigations of credible atrocity allegations and for the Biden administration to respond to Congress immediately on its progress towards a determination of war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. Finally, I'm glad to be an original co-sponsor on the Burma Act, and I thank Chairman Mix and Congressman Shabbat for their leadership on this important initiative to hold the military junta of Myanmar accountable for overthrowing their de de democratically elected government. Included in the bill is $220 million in assistance for the Rohingya refugee population that continues to experience substandard conditions and violence, as well as a requirement for the Biden administration to determine whether the Burmese military's atrocities against the Rohingya constitute genocide. I'm proud to support this measure and ensure our country continues to stand strong as a leader in supporting democratic rule of law and human rights around the world. Thank you, and I yield back. The general lady yields back. Any other members wish to be recognized? Hearing no further requests for recognition, the committee will proceed to consider the notice of items in block. Pursuant to the previous order, the question occurs on the measures in block as amended if amended. We're going to take a vote by voice. And all members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The measures considered in block are agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Pursuant to the previous order of the committee, each measure is ordered favorably reported as amended if amended, and each amendment or amendments to each bill shall be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, staff is authorized to make any technical and conforming changes. <coughs> now on to the next item of business. We'll be considering separately the following measure. HR 4914, the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act. Pursuant to notice, for purposes of markup, I now call up no. HR 4914, the clerk will report the bill. HR 4914, to impose sanctions against foreign persons and foreign governments. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and without objection, the bill shall be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. And without objection, the McCall Amendment in the nature of substitute number 42, circulated to members, shall be considered as read and will be treated as original text for purposes of amendment. At this time, I recognize myself to speak on this measure. In 2016, reports first emerged of an anonymous health incidents among U.S. personnel overseas characterized by a concerning array of traumatic brain injury symptoms, now collo colloquially referred to as Havana Syndrome. Experts convened by the State Department in 2017 attributed these symptoms to a non-natural source and the National Academy of Sciences in 2020 described them as plausible, uh, the result of directed pulsed radio frequency energy. Since then, these bizarre events have increased in frequency and scope, with recent press reports estimating roughly 200 such suspected attacks against U.S. personnel in multiple locations around the world. Investigation into the nature and cause of these anonymous health incidents continues. And President Biden has committed to bring to bear the full resources of the federal government to get to the bottom of them. In that effort, he has the full support and partnership of this committee. But before I go on, let me speak directly to our diplomats and their families who have reported being impacted by suspected attacks 
or anomalous health incidents. We believe you. We lament the fact, we lament the harm it has caused to your health, well-being, and careers. And we will not let this threat to you and your colleagues persist unchallenged. The ranking member's amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4914 would make clear that it is the policy of the United States to deter any suspect, suspected attacks of this sort, provide assistance to those affected, prioritize research into measures to protect our personnel, and hold accountable anyone responsible for them. The ANS to the bill would um, permissibly authorize sanctions against any foreign persons or governments the president determines responsible for any such attacks against U.S. personnel resulting in brain injury, mandate reporting to Congress on the nature of and response to any such clandestine attacks or anomalous health incidents, and express the sense of Congress that the executive branch should prioritize coordination to investigate and deter suspected attacks or um, anomalous health incidents. Many of you know I am of the mind that sanctions are a powerful foreign tool that should only be deployed carefully. So it is a red line for me that these authorities be permissive and that the executive branch be afforded the flexibility it needs to respond to a still evolving situation. But it is squarely in the jurisdiction of this committee to be debating and authorizing the appropriate use of foreign policy tools, which is why I have agreed to consider the ranking member's ANS today. It is reasonable to have permissive sanction tools ready for consideration when we are dealing with what many increasingly worry could prove to be a detrimental physical attacks against our very own people. I'm pleased that this Congress previously passed the Havana Act recently signed into law authorizing additional financial support for individuals harmed by anomalous health incidents. This committee must also now be willing to have the hard conversations about diplomatic engagement and foreign policy responses needed to stop such harm. As such, I appreciate the ranking member's willingness to offer the ANS, and I support this measure. Do any other members wish to speak on the measure? I yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. I recognize the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you uh, for working with me on this important uh, bill. Um, you know, around the world, American personnel are being attacked in their homes and hotels and even on public streets. What first started in Havana in late 2016 has now expanded to attacks all around the world, including right here in Washington, D.C. There are hundreds of victims, including children, and recent cases have been reported in Vietnam, Vienna, Berlin, and Bogota. We must find out who is behind these attacks and hold them responsible. And we must reassure the people who serve our nation overseas that we have their backs. To help deter future harm, Congress needs to call these incidents what they are, attacks. And that is what this measure does. We need to ensure that there will be consequences for those who are responsible. And that's why I introduced the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act. My bill we are considering here today, with the chairman's support, will do just that by authorizing broad sanctions against those who are attacking Americans. It establishes a policy to prevent, punish, and deter these attacks. And it requires greater transparency with Congress about what is happening, and most importantly, what the United States is doing in response. I've worked with the chairman and his staff for two months to get this legislation to a place where we could get it marked up and passed out of committee on a bipartisan basis. And I'm pleased that we were able to come to an agreement on this critical issue. And that's why I will be opposing amendments from either side of the aisle that would upset this agreement that we have made, uh, Mr. Chairman. Changing the bipartisan, this bipartisan bill will jeopardize its passage in its current form and could weaken it. Americans are being attacked and they expect us to work together to help them. So again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for considering this bill today. It's an important measure. And uh, with that, I yield back. Ranking member yields back. 
I now recognize Representative Sarah Jacobs of California for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And first, I want to thank the ranking member, Mr. McCall, for all of your work and efforts to ensure that this pressing issue gets due attention. And while I appreciate and agree with my colleagues' concern about the health and well-being of our diplomats overseas, I have to say I disagree with this bill. It is clear our foreign service officers have suffered from distressing neurological symptoms and widespread fear, and we need to get to the bottom of what happened here and continue with robust investigations. However, I do think the sanctions authorized by this bill are premature and possibly not the right tools to begin with. By prospectively authorizing the president to impose sanctions against an unspecified entity for reasons we have not been able to fully determine yet, we are tying our hands on properly assessing what would be the appropriate and effective response once we are actually are able to review the details. As we are still dealing with the consequences of the 2001 AUMF that was overly broad, we have to make sure we don't make the same mistake. We're not able to assess the anticipated economic and political implications of sanctions if we don't know who they're targeted against. We can't ensure this is the right tool when we don't have all the facts, and we can't pair these sanctions with a clear and effective strategy when we don't know what the threat or potential threat actually is. We need to ensure we're seriously investigating the cause of so much suffering of our diplomats. But this bill is not the answer, and more importantly, it sets a bad precedent for Congress's authority over the use of sanctions. And for these reasons, I oppose and urge my colleagues to do the same. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back, and I recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey for five minutes. Not hearing Mr. Smith, I now recognize Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina for five minutes. Without hearing from Mr. Wilson, I now recognize Representative Abigail Spamberger of Virginia, who's the vice chair of the subcommittee on Europe, Energy, and the Environmental an environment and cyber for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for their work uh, in bringing this bill forward for markup, addressing the Havana syndrome attacks deserve the highest level of urgency uh, of Congress and of our government. It's absolutely critical that the United States government provide care to affected personnel, investigate what is going on, and deter and prevent future attacks. I know that public servants, people who've dedicated their careers to serving and protecting our nation are facing the persistent uh, threat of these ongoing attacks. And I know people who have been impacted, who have experienced these attacks and now face uh, debilitating consequences, a complete change in their lives an inability to continue in the pursuit of their professional career. And we must do everything that we can do to provide them with the assistance they need and prevent more people, public servants, from experiencing what they have gone through. I've had the pleasure of working with the chairman and the ranking member on this issue before, and I am so grateful that we are continuing these efforts today with Representative McCall's legislation, the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act. I thank the ranking member for working with the chair to make important refining edits to this bill, and I am proud to support it. I appreciate that this bill makes it clear that Congress is ready to provide the tools necessary to address these suspected attacks with the highest level of concern and urgency. And I appreciate uh, and I was glad to have, and I appreciated that Chair Meeks and Ranking Member McCall joined my amendment that was included in the House Pass NDAA focused on bolstering the interagency response to these suspected attacks. Enacting my legislation would help structure and prioritize a robust whole of government response to Havana syndrome attacks. And the bill we are considering today builds off the steps that Congress has already taken. However, we must keep our legislative and oversight efforts going to ensure that the response of the U.S. government is well coordinated, effective, and strong. Anything less would be a dereliction of our duty 
to protect this nation and our selfless public servants as they go about the business of protecting us. I appreciate Ranking Member McCall's legislative efforts and the Chair's commitment on this issue. I look forward to continuing to work closely with this committee, other members of Congress in the House and Senate, and the administration to get right at the heart of this critical issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I urge all of my colleagues to vote yes on this bill, and I yield back. General, General Lady yields back. I now recognize Representative Wagner of Missouri for five minutes. I thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your willingness to work with the ranking member and all of us to advance uh, H.R. 4914, the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act, which I am proud to co-sponsor. The underlying legislation holds Castro's brutal communist regime accountable for directly attacking U.S. citizens. As many as 200 Americans, primarily individuals serving their country as part of the State Department, Department of Defense, and Intelligence Community, have suffered traumatic brain injuries while stationed in Cuba. Recently, scientific analysis has revealed that the attacks were most likely the result of, quote, directed pulsed radio frequency energy. This bill punishes the attackers by authorizing the president to sanction those determined to be responsible. It will protect Americans by deterring future attacks. There must be, Mr. Chairman, serious, unambiguous consequences for attacking U.S. citizens. It is both reasonable and prudent for the United States to sanction the individuals responsible for the Havana attacks. Furthermore, it would deter any president um, uh, from, under, or from, from uh, imposing sanctions and and uh, uh, I want to make sure that uh, the tools are available to both the legislative and executive branch moving forward. I urge my colleagues to vote yes and to support the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act, um, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize Representative Andy Levin of Michigan for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I support most of the measures that came before us today, and I'm grateful to you and the ranking member for your work on them, uh, especially the uh, situations in Burma and um, in Tigray, and, uh, and thank uh, Chairwoman Bass of the Subcommittee on Africa for all that great work. But I do I uh, want to express my concerns about this one measure, measure, H.R. 4914. You know, I share all of my colleagues' alarm regarding the illnesses that have impacted U.S. personnel, both at home and abroad. And I thank the ranking member for his attention to this really very, very serious matter. We absolutely need to protect the hardworking individuals serving our country and I want us to get to the bottom of these incidents as soon as possible and do whatever is necessary to make sure they don't continue to occur. That being said, this is really a matter of, of how to make policy. I worry that there are still too many unknowns for us to prepare a thoughtful, effective policy response to these incidents and to craft a successful deterrent if they are indeed found to be attacks. In service to the Americans who serve us in this way around the world and in the interest of responsible policymaking, I feel that we ought to have more questions answered before we advance this legislation. And I fully support devoting whatever resources are necessary to getting those answers ASAP. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina for five minutes. <laughs> I understand Mr. Wilson has some audio problems. We'll come back to him. I'll recognize Mr. Mr. Chairman. There you go, Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> hey, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm grateful to support House Resolution 4914. 
the Havana Syndrome Attacks Response Act, which has been drafted and introduced by Ranking Member Mike McCall. The safety and security of American diplomats and Department of Defense personnel is critical to the success of our missions around the world. Today, mm. hosts around the world. This is outrageous. This bill underscores the commitment of Congress to assist victims, research the countermeasures, and most importantly, to identify and hold responsible the parties accountable. Thank you for Mr. Chairman Meeks, and thank you, Ranking Member Mike McCall, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you to the Ranking Member for working on what is a very important issue that all of us are gravely concerned about. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sit on the House Intelligence Committee now since 2016, and for a few years at least, we have been dealing with uh, this issue. Um, and so I know that you know, I've had a chance to work with uh, Ranking Member McCall on different legislation, on cyber and other pieces of legislation. And I know that this is a sincere uh, piece of legislation. But I am concerned because, uh, you know, I, I have concerns about prescribing the consequences before we've confirmed the culprits here. And so I feel that, that this is a bit premature. Um, I know that all of us want to be able to hold these folks accountable, the nations accountable, or whoever it may be that's responsible for harming our diplomats. Uh, but I also think that once we have all the information in front of us, we'll be in a better position to do that. With that, I yield back, Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Votes have been called on the House floor. So therefore, this committee will go into recess until after the votes are completed on the House floor, we will resume immediately thereafter. Committee's now in recess.
four, three, two, one. The committee will come to order. Do any other members wish to speak on the measure? Hearing no further requests, let's move on to amendments. For what purpose does the representative from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I've got an amendment to desk. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to your staff virtually and here in the hearing room. Mr. Chairman, which number amendment is the gentleman offering? I've got 366 and 367, I believe, so we can do them in order. Let's, Let's do 366. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4914. Everyone received a copy of the amendment? Clerk will please report the amendment. Harry Amendment Number 366 to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4914, page 11. Without correct. further object, without objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A point of order is reserved. The representative from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The current language within the ANS of this bill is weak. A foreign government sanctioned under this bill can have those same sanctions removed by the President if that country promises not to conduct clandestine attacks on U.S. personnel. The absurdity of that is simply breathtaking, as if we're supposed to take Putin's or Xi's word for it that they'll stop attacking our personnel. I mean, they shouldn't be attacking them in the first place. The second precondition isn't much better. It places the burden of proof on the executive branch and says that if the President doesn't have persuasive information that an attack resulted in brain injury to the U.S. personnel over the last six months, that is ground for vacating the sanctions described in the bill. The sanctions are time-tested IEPA sanctions, including the blocking of property and assets and revocation of visas. Not a single person here would be in favor of applying, the, wouldn't be in favor of applying those sanctions against the perpetrator of these attacks, I would hope. I am firmly opposed to creating such an easy litmus test for removing these sanctions. It gives offending countries an opportunity to use these attacks as leverage to extract concessions from the United States at certain points, only to turn around and apologize to have the sanctions removed. Sanctions once implemented should require an enormous about face in the way the offending country interacts with the United States. American personnel stationed around the world to include our Foreign Service officers and CIA deserve our full backing and support against those who wish to do them harm. Creating such an easy litmus test for the removal of sanctions is an insult to those who have been attacked and who have endured horrific brain trauma. This amendment would make it clear that once sanctioned, a foreign government may not see its sanctions removed absent an act of Congress. This amendment would make it clear to the rest of the world that we will not tolerate any kind of attacks on our personnel, and we would serve would also serve as a useful deterrent against future attacks or, if you're so inclined, against anomalous health incidents. A truly tragic aspect of all this is that we have the policy tools to mitigate the frequency of these attacks while we determine which foreign adversary is behind them. One of those tools is deterrence, and its applicability here is both obvious and useful. In a circumstance in which we are confronting an adversary with advanced technology, technological capabilities, the tightening of the removal of sanctions provisions would still make them think twice about attacking our citizens. The current provision on the removal of sanctions will also be ready, correction, read by foreign adversaries as a total lack of commitment to those who dedicate their lives to the security of our nation. This has a broader implication that several of my colleagues apparently do not fully appreciate. If we are unable or worse, unwilling to aggressively target those inflicting debilitating harm on our citizens, that has implications for everyone who commits themselves to the defense and preservation of our republic, and that's unacceptable. To me, this is 
a pretty common sense provision, and to reject it would be to embrace weakness. I urge my colleagues to accept this amendment, and I yield back the balance. Would, would, would my friend yield for a question? Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry said he's yielded back the balance of his time. Mr. I Chairman, now, I, I, I now, recognition for a question. I did not hear you, Mr. Connolly. The gentleman yield back the balance of his time. He has no more time. I now uh, recognize myself. I oppose this amendment. I know. I'm seeking recognition. I can't hear you, Mr. Connolly. I don't hear you, Mr. Connolly. We'll go back. Let me proceed. I would recognize myself. I oppose this amendment because it is unnecessary and overly restrictive, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. The bill already includes the clear criteria for certifying when any sanctions imposed under the act should be removed. And as I've st already stated, Sanctions are indeed a powerful foreign policy tool. And in my opinion, it's simply common sense in this still unfolding situation to provide the administration necessary flexibility in both their imposition and removal. I yield back the balance of my time. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Recognize Representative Wagner for five minutes. Excuse me. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, I have to stand in strong opposition to Mr. Perry's amendment. The gentleman's amendment adds a sanctions removal requirement that will, in fact, discourage the president from imposing the critical sanctions authorized by the underlying bill. It completely removes the president's authority to lift sanctions without a new specific act of Congress removing those sanctions. This is well beyond anything ever enacted in U.S. law. The United States needs to demonstrate its resolve, its strong resolve to protect all Americans by sanctioning those who attacked our personnel in Havana, who were serving at the behest of our government in the State Department, the Department of Defense. This amendment all but guarantees that those sanctions will not be levied, Mr. Chairman. It would deter any president, current or future, from ever imposing the sanctions. This undermines one of our most valuable foreign policy tools and sets a terrible precedence. I urge my colleagues to protect the integrity and utility of our sanctions system and oppose the gentleman's amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the amendment number 366. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose of the representative from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I've got an amendment at the desk. The clerk shall distribute, which, that's 367. 367, correct? yes, sir. The clerk shall distribute the amendment to your staff virtually and here in the hearing room. Has everyone received a copy of the amendment? The clerk will please report the amendment. Perry Amendment Number 367 to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4914. Page Without five. objection, further reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. A point of order is reserved, and the representative from Pennsylvania is now recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are instances during committee markups when the underlying bill is stronger than its ANS, and this is one of those instances. The way the ANS is written, even if the President determines that these so-called anomalous health in incidents are actually being orchestrated by a malign actor, the President is not required to do anything to protect U.S. personnel. In short, this ANS does absolutely nothing. Let me repeat that again. Even if China or Russia or another American adversary is attacking U.S. personnel and leaving them with debilitating brain trauma, this committee is ready to tell the President of the United States that he or she does not have to react in any way whatsoever. I'm not sure if that's not dereliction of duty, but I don't know what it is if that's not. The underlying bill and the ANS cite an important study on the issue, a 2020 report by the National Academy of Sciences. In that report, the researchers argue that many of the distinctive and acute signs, symptoms, and observations reported by affected employees are consistent with the effects of directed pulsed radio frequency energy, and that directed pulsed EF energy appears to be the most plausible mechanism in explaining these cases. Despite this study, the Biden administration is refusing to acknowledge the near reality that these are not just random health incidents, they are almost certainly directed attacks from an adversary. What is logically absurd about this ANS, given the administration's position, is that countries may be sanctioned for what are essentially random anomalous health incidents. First of all, why on earth would the United States Congress waste its time passing a bill to give the president authority he already has? More to the point, why on earth would we waste our time in punishing anomalous health incidents? An anomalous or irregular health incident could literally mean anything. It's a vacuous expression meant to shield the administration from any responsibility or accountability in protecting the American people, its first obligation and sacred duty. We've seen time and again that this administration consistently fails at keeping our citizens safe. For anyone who needs convincing, let me remind you of the hundreds of Americans still stranded in the Taliban's 13th century Islamist theocracy. With respect to this bill, here's the point. If these Havana syndrome attacks are truly anomalous health incidents, then there's no purpose for this ANS at all. It simply doesn't make sense. Worse still, it gives the administration an easy out. Even if the Biden administration received enough evidence to prompt them to finally concede that a foreign adversary is attacking U.S. personnel, even in that case, they still wouldn't be pressured by Congress to apply sanctions against offending foreign persons and governments. That is why I've introduced an amendment to strike several instances in this bill where it says the president only may apply sanctions, instead directs that the president shall apply sanctions against offending foreign persons and governments. There is bipartisan consensus, consensus that these are attacks being conducted by a foreign adversary. And if the Biden administration fails to call out these attacks for what they are, they are providing aid and comfort to our enemies and encouraging future attacks on American personnel. With that, I urge the passage of this amendment and I yield the balance. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I oppose this amendment because it's overly restrictive and unhelpful to the bipartisan work of this committee. And I encourage all my colleagues to do the same. As I said before, investigations are ongoing to fully understand the cause of these anomalous health incidents, which I strongly support, since we need the best information possible to inform our actions. So flexibility is key. The executive branch must have latitude to deploy these tools most effectively as the picture becomes clear. These sanctions authorities must be permissive. It is my understanding that H.R. 4914, as introduced, was the only bill put forth in the House during this Congress related to Havana syndrome that was not originally bipartisan. But the work of my team, working with Mr. Ranking Member McCall and the Republican staff for over two months, as Mr. McCall has stated, to negotiate permissive authorities that members from both sides of the aisle can support corrects that anomaly and reflects the proud tradition we have on this committee of putting politics aside when dealing with such serious matters. This amendment seeks to undo the hard work and focus uh, and work that I really appreciate working with Mr. McCall uh, in coming to a bipartisan consensus. And therefore, I oppose it. I yield back the balance of my time. 
Is there any further debate on the amendment? Hearing no further requests to speak, the question is on the Perry Amendment number 367. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, please unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Okay. All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The question is now on the McCall Amendment and the nature of a substitute number 42. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, again, please unmute your microphone. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The question now is to report HR 4914 with the recommendation that the bill do pass as amended. We're going to take a vote by voice. All members, again, unmute your microphones. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Without objection, staff <laughs> is authorized to make any technical and conforming changes. This concludes our business today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I make a, uh, just in uh, conclusion, I want to thank every, all the members. Uh, I want to thank you for working with me in a bipartisan way, as you stated. That is a tradition of this committee, and I intend to, to fulfill that. And um, I also want to thank all the members, particularly you, Mr. Chairman, all the members on both sides of the aisle. As you know, I missed the last markup because my wife was uh, – at MD Anderson hospitalized with cancer. Um, and it was very heartfelt to me to have um, members on both sides of the aisle contact me wishing her well, and, and she is well. And um, for that, I'm very grateful. I yield back. Thank you. And we con continue to have your wife uh, in our prayers. Uh, we welcome you back. You were missed. <laughs> you were missed. Miss Wagner, Miss Miss Representative Wagner did do a fine job, but there's only one Michael McCall, and it is indeed. You know, people often don't know what happens behind the scenes and the conversations that we have. It is a pleasure to have you as a partner of working together in the spirit of bipartisanship and trying to move our committee. Uh, to forward in the same traditions that we've always done. So it is good to have you as my partner on this Foreign Affairs Committee, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. This concludes our business today. And uh, all of the, and I want to thank also all the staffs on both sides of the aisles, because that is uh, really important. They have worked very hard uh, on this and getting together. So I, I just want to make sure I acknowledge the staffs on both sides of the aisle for all of the work that you've done, uh, as well as all of the members on both sides of the aisle for your contributions and your assistance uh, with today's markups. Uh, it's truly an honor to be the chair of this committee. Uh, with that, the, uh, this, this markup is now adjourned. <laughs>